welcome to Principles of Atatürk and History of Turkish Revolution course. In this program, we'll focus on constitutionalism and the reign of Abdülhamid II. We'll mainly discuss the first Ottoman constitution and constitutional regime, the Ottoman-Russian War, reign of Abdülhamid II, and finally, the rise of nationalism and its aftermath in the Ottoman Empire. Let's first remember the situation in the empire before the declaration of the Ottoman constitution. It was during the reign of Abdulaziz when the suspension of the interest payments of the Ottoman debts was announced. This was, in a way, the declaration of a bankruptcy. Meanwhile, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Bulgaria and Salonika, peasant rebellions broke out. These problems caused two coup attempts in Istanbul and, as a result, Sultan Abdulaziz was deposed by a group led by Mithat Pasha and Murat V came to power. Mithat Pasha and his fellows had already prepared a draft of a constitution, but it couldn't be declared because Sultan Murat V had mental problems. Then he was replaced by Abdulhamid II, who had promised to accept the constitution. As soon as he came to power, Abdulhamid II formed a commission for the preparation of a constitution. The commission examined different examples and came up with a draft which was approved by Abdulhamid and was named Kanuni Esasi. According to Kanuni Esasi, the parliament would have two chambers, Chamber of Notables and Senate, and Chamber of Deputies. With the approval of the constitution, Mithat Pasha was appointed as the Grand Vizier and Sultan Abdulhamid declared the constitution with the hope that European intervention would stop. The declaration of the constitution was on the same day that the shipyard conference convened in Istanbul. Serbia had started a war against Ottomans in the Balkans, and with the intervention of Russia, this conference was being held to end the problems in the region. The demands of the European powers were rejected by a consultation council, the head of which was Mithat Pasha. When the shipyard conference ended without a solution, Sultan Abdulhamid II held Mithat Pasha responsible for that and sent him into exile after dismissing him. In accordance with the constitution, the first elections were held in 1877. After the elections, the first Ottoman parliament was opened with 141 members on March 19th. Meanwhile, Russia declared war on the Ottomans, demanding reforms in the Balkans. Although it continued to work until February 1878, the parliament was dissolved by Sultan Abdulhamid because of the war. The Ottoman-Russian War is known as War of 93, as the war broke out in 1293 of the Hejira calendar. The reason behind the war was the shipyard conference. Russians declared war on the Ottomans because they couldn't get what they wanted at the conference. After attacks both in the Balkans and Anatolia, Russians occupied Kars, Ardahan, Batum, Bayezid, and Sofia. The Ottoman forces were able to stop Russians in Plevna for a while, but then Russians occupied Edirne and advanced to Istanbul. On the Ottomans' demand, Britain acted as a mediator and Russia accepted an armistice. In 1878, the Treaty of San Stefano was signed. The terms of the treaty were what Europeans demanded at the shipyard conference division of Ottoman Rumelia into Bulgaria and Eastern Rumelia, Bulgaria's autonomy, Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania's independence, reforms in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Rumelia, and for Armenians in Anatolia. Kars, Ardahan, Batum, and Bayezid were left to Russia as war indemnity. This treaty was the victory of Russia's pan-Slavist policy. However, the Balkan countries, Austria and England's dissatisfaction with the terms and their objections resulted in international convention in Berlin to revise the terms of the Treaty of San Stefano. The Berlin Congress was in fact a meeting to discuss the Eastern Question. Eastern Question referred to the problems emerged among Western powers to control the regions under the Ottoman rule in the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries. According to the Treaty of Berlin, Russia agreed to hand over El Valley and Bayezid to the Ottomans and promised that Batum would be a free port. In the Balkans, Greater Bulgaria was divided into three. Bulgaria proper became autonomous under Ottoman rule. 
Eastern Rumelia was given administrative autonomy and Macedonia remained under Ottoman rule. The Ottomans lost territories and also promised reforms and improvements for Armenians and religious liberty for non-Muslims. Another war in this period was the Ottoman Greek War, which broke out after a rebellion on the island of Crete. Greece sent a fleet to the island and proclaimed the annexation of Crete, but the Ottomans defeated Greeks and the peace treaty was signed between the two. Crete remained under Ottoman rule, but soon after the treaty, an autonomous government was formed in Crete by creating an international protectorate and eventually, in 1908, Crete united with Greece. Now, let's talk about Abdulhamid II's internal and external policies and his reforms. One of the things that Sultan Abdulhamid II did was to keep the young Ottomans away from Istanbul. Because after he closed the parliament during the Russian war, the young Ottomans staged two coup attempts, which are known as Chiran Raid and Second Chiran Incident. In this atmosphere, Abdulhamid II established a total political control called the Istibdat and ruled the empire with an iron hand. He had conservative policies to get internal support. He used the title of caliph and followed pan-Islamist policies to get the support of Muslim countries. Abdulhamid formed a secret police organization and appointed informants to every department of the government. He used the reports of the organization for appointments, promotions and dismissals in civil bureaucracy and in the army. As part of his autocratic rule, he imposed censorship on the press and publications. Despite his conservative policies, Abdulhamid II focused on the adaptation and transfer of technology in military, railway construction, and telegraph lines. During his reign, factories were founded. Modern farming and agriculture were introduced to Ottoman peasants. Westernization and modernization were important for him, so the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts was opened and the first cinema show was introduced to the empire. Women periodicals were published and first women aid societies were established during his reign. In essence, he had a high opinion of secondary education. In order to finance his reforms, he allocated some amount of the taxes to education and during his reign, the number of primary, secondary and high schools increased across the country. It is important to note here that education of girls was important for him so he opened vocational schools for girls too. The vocational schools aimed at training future bureaucrats, technicians, veterinarians, and agricultural experts. In addition to modernizing the Imperial School for Civil Servants, he founded Imperial Law School. The first Ottoman university, Dar el Funun, was reorganized and reestablished. All these schools raised a new generation who would help the foundation of Turkish Republic. Abdulhamid II started his military reforms by establishing the High Commission of Military Inspection and authority over Serasker. Being the chair of this commission, he had control over the army. He changed the conscription system. Specifically, he abolished the military exemption payment and made military service compulsory for all Muslim males at the age of 20. Well, of course, with a few exceptions. Another thing he did was establishing a cavalry unit called Hamidiyah regiments. This unit was composed of Kurdish and Turkmen tribesmen whose task was to counter Russian attacks in the eastern border and to combat the Armenian terrorist attacks in eastern Anatolia. Abdulhamid II had efforts to modernize the army, so he cooperated with Germany, but only land forces were strengthened with German methods and the Ottoman army became dependent on German arms industry. We have already said that Abdulhamid II had pan-Islamist policies. As a political ideology, pan-Islamism aimed at uniting Islamic societies, claiming the Sultan as a universal caliph. Abdulhamid II's pan-Islamist policies had two basic goals. To protect the country in the short term and to establish unity of the world of Islam around caliphate in the long term. We can see Abdulhamid's pan-Islamist policy in his reforms in education and in his appointments to important positions. He also ordered the construction of Hejaz railway line, 
which connected Mecca and Medina, and which gave control on the Muslim regions. He wanted to secure the enslaved Muslims of the world as well. Abdul Hamid II got the support of the Ottoman Muslims, but losing Tunis, Egypt, and Suez Canal was a disappointment. He couldn't strengthen his control in Arab lands either. During the reign of Abdul Hamid II, the financial situation of the empire was really bad. The accumulation of debts caused the establishment of public debt commission by the European states, whose banks lent money to the empire. This commission controlled all financial sources and foreign investments of the Ottomans. Because of the financial difficulties, agriculture became important and so did the modernization of farming methods. As a result, the Agricultural Bank was founded to serve two purposes. To provide agricultural credits for public improvement and to compete with the foreign-owned Ottoman Bank. Railroad construction was one of the most important investments during the reign of Abdul Hamid II. Before his reign, foreign powers had started constructing railroads in the empire for their own trade interests, and the first railroad had been constructed between Izmir and Aydın by a British company. During Abdul Hamid's reign, the Anatolian railroads connected important cities to Istanbul and later were extended to Baghdad by Germans. Hejaz Railroad, on the other hand, connected the wider Ottoman rail network and made it easier for pilgrims to visit Mecca and Medina. Constructing railroads was important because internal conflicts could be prevented or controlled by transporting the troops and tax collection would be easier without the prevention of the bandits. Railway networks opened the remote parts of the empire to international trade and to effective government control. However, the empire became more dependent on European and especially German capital. This dependency caused the Ottoman nationalism among the young generation. In the early 19th century, nationalist movements began to affect the Ottomans especially in the Balkans and later spread to the other parts of the empire. The Ottoman Greeks, Albanians, Serbians, Bulgarians founded their organizations, some of which turned into terrorist organizations supported by European powers, and they killed many Muslims in the Balkans. Meanwhile, in Anatolia, Armenians established organizations to revive Greater Armenia and made attacks on Muslim population. As a reaction to all these nationalist movements, Ottoman Muslims began to get organized and called themselves the Young Turks. The Young Turks, or Jön Turks as the Europeans called them, were not content with Abdul Hamid's policies and wanted to restore the constitution. Their secret society, Ottoman Union Society, attracted many people, including bureaucrats, officers, ulema, and different ethnic groups, all of whom wanted to get rid of the Sultan. As new members joined the Union, however, Ideological differences arose, and the Young Turks were split into two groups, one of which was the Ottoman Committee of Union and Progress. Meanwhile, a young captain, Mustafa Kemal, founded Fatherland Society while he was serving in the 5th Army in Damascus. This society later merged with the Committee of Union and Progress. Well, this is the end of our program for Chapter 4. In this video, we have discussed constitutionalism and the reign of Abdul Hamid II. Join us for the next program. Goodbye.